Can everyone hear me? So, uh, I'd like to start out by asking if anyone knows what international relations, macroeconomics, and astrology have in common. Anyone? International relations, macroeconomics, and astrology. No, we got no takers? All right. I'm going to let you in on a secret. They are all B S. The problem with international relations is that it is essentially cargo cult science. It's dressed up uh, as if it is a real form of science, uh, except it doesn't make verifiable uh, predictions. Causal density refers to the idea that there are lots of different causes that are affecting something. So we can imagine causes as all of these various lines that are coming in here. Experimental leakage refers to the ability to isolate those causes from one another. So imagine that each of these boxes is a separate experiment. The reason that we have reliable information about things like chemistry, for example, is that we're able to isolate all the causes and we're able to segregate the data leakage so that we can control all the variables. There are no experiments in international relations. If I were to ask what was the effect of US intervention in World War I, you could offer a million different theories and it would be impossible for me to prove or disprove any of them because they're all based on an experiment that happened once where there were no controls. I think that both of these are self-serving and they don't really explain much of anything. And so I'm going to reveal the real secret to international relations right now. It is power, transition, theory. And this is actually what I, what I really do believe. Power transition theory answers a question that had bothered me uh, for a lot of my time in debate that I did not know the answer to, which was why did some of the smallest countries in Europe begin as world powers? Anyone want to offer a guess as to why that might be? So for example, Britain, very small uh, island, it became a huge world power and then it is essentially off the map in terms of being a global force. Why would that happen? The answer is industrialization. That industrialization is something that maximizes the, the societal capital of nations so much that they become, that they have this leap in their capability. And so and it's, it hasn't happened equally all over the world. And so there were countries in Europe that industrialized first and that those countries therefore had this, this leap uh, in their relative power from a, uh, even though they start out with low populations. Uh, now you have uh, countries like China, for example, that start out with large populations but that are largely uh, not industrialized, but that they're becoming industrialized. And so there's, there may be a lag in the rate of industrialization, but once the world is completely industrialized, then uh, the, the countries that have the, the biggest populations uh, and the biggest uh, amounts of land to support those populations uh, will be in charge. This is critical for understanding Russia's position in the world because the concept of power transition theory means that there are at any given period of time essentially two coalitions. There are status quo powers. Those are powers who favor the current international system. Russia, for example, has a vast amount of land and a, I wouldn't say a small population, but certainly small compared to India or China, and a, a shrinking older population. Russia has a position on the UN Security Council. It is viewed as essentially one of the most powerful states in the world, except that is based on its uh, legacy of industrialization. If you go through Russia, you'll see all of this industry left from the, the Soviet Union. Uh, you're not seeing an explosion of industry in Russia the way that you are in India or China. And so it is fundamentally in Russia's interest to try to maintain the current uh, balance of power because 
because Russia would prefer, for example, not to give up the eastern portion uh, of its country to China. Uh, whereas you know, China would be very interested in the resources uh, that exist in Russia's Far East uh, and in Siberia, uh, and they would love to maybe house some of their massive growing population uh, in that area of land, something that I doubt many of you would be thrilled with. Uh, and so this raises an interesting question, though. How is it that Russia, which is a status quo power, could be cooperating with these, uh, these rival powers of China uh, and India in BRICS? Is there a contradiction? Because BRICS normally we think of as something that represents emerging powers, but Russia is anything but an emerging power. It's really the ultimate legacy power. So does anyone see a tension with Russia being involved in BRICS? I see tension. The, the tension that, that I see is essentially that Russia uh, is bandwagoning right now. It's partnering with anyone who is a foe of the United States in the West. And that's completely logical. And it's a, a natural uh, consequence of power transition theory. That in any given point in time, there will be the, the country that is dominant in the system of international relations. And so right now, that is the United States. Now, our relative power may be declining, except we're still, for now, the top dog. Uh, and so Russia and China are temporarily able to overlook uh, their differences with one another because they have this common interest of thwarting American hegemony uh, around the globe. Uh, and so you see Russia engaging in behavior that really only makes sense in terms of opposition to the United States. So for example, Russia is uh, partnering with China right now for joint naval exercises in the South China Sea. Uh, it's not because Russia has any particular interest uh, in China having control of the South China Sea. Uh, it's rather because Russia has an interest in uh, defeating the United States in every proxy uh, area of conflict uh, around the world. Not saying that I fault Russia for, by the way. Uh, America has the, the inverse interest. Uh, and so as we look at these, these different uh, areas of conflict between Russia and the United States, it's important to think not only about this micro question of what are the direct interests, but what are the, the broader interests uh, that are at play. 